The Lord hath reigned over all the nations. God sitteth on his holy throne. Words taken from the Alleluia verse for this Sunday after the ascension. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. St. Paul, in one of his letters, calls Catholics ambassadors of Christ. The term ambassador applied especially to the apostles and to their successors, the bishops, as well as the priests that worked under them. But by extension, it applies to all the members of the mystical body of Christ, which is only the Roman Catholic Church. With this in mind, we can put forth an image for the church, namely the embassy of Christ. I mean, ambassadors are part of an embassy. Our dearest Lord once said to his chosen disciples, He who heareth you, heareth me, and he who despiseth you, despiseth me. Now, the embassy of the church does not represent a foreign power, but rather that land that is not of this world, the kingdom of heaven. This is an eternal kingdom that rises above all earthly nations. But like any embassy or diplomatic mission, the church is to represent the interests of the homeland. The church must sustain the cause of the master of the universe by proclaiming his holy law, respecting his holy name, having that spread and even reverenced, to protect his glory and to prevent any outrages committed against his majesty. And yes, the embassy of the church also dispenses all the blessings and graces of heaven upon those nations of the world. But besides protecting the rights of Almighty God, the church's diplomatic mission, if you will, is to also make the children of Adam, the children of this world, into the adopted children of God the Father in Jesus Christ, thus preparing them for their final entrance into that kingdom that shall have no end. The church militant, that's what we call it on earth, the church militant is called to extend the territory of Christ, to manifest his social reign over all men, and to consecrate this world to Christ, thus renewing the face of the earth by the power of the Holy Ghost who came on Pentecost Sunday. Now, in a sense, an embassy is considered sovereign territory or the property of that power that established it. That is why U.S. embassies throughout the world have a marine guard which provides armed security to protect the embassy and the diplomatic compound. In recent decades, citizens of the United States have witnessed the embarrassment and even the tragedy of some of these properties being the object of attack. From Saigon in 1975 to Tehran in 1979, up until the recent Benghazi attack, we have seen embarrassing evacuations, hostage takings, and yes, brutal murders, torture, and even the mistreatment of our own ambassadors, diplomats, and other State Department officials. A nation begins to show weakness when it cannot protect itself nor its interests in a foreign land. The leader of the nation becomes an object of ridicule. The white flag is raised, the embassy is invaded, and then comes the ensuing surrender. In regards to the embassy of the church, we have witnessed various, if you will, diplomatic disasters in this modern age. Instead of defending the interests of our king like a loyal marine guard, we have allowed him to be insulted, mocked, despised, all by various rebellious subjects and enemies. We have largely dismissed or even disdained the religious patrimony left to us by our faithful ancestors. Called to be members of a church militant, we have become impotent members standing idly by as the cause of Christ loses more and more ground. 
We find ourselves often embarrassed by the teachings of the church fathers, the doctors, and the magisterial giants of earlier times. Over past centuries, not just the past few decades, over the past few centuries, there has been one surrender after another, and a virtual white flag is raised over the cupola of St. Peter's Basilica. One of the first major surrenders was to the ideology of scientism, not science, the ideology, the religion of scientism. The church was always the great patron of science, of course, and without her presence and support, science would never have advanced. But as modern man supposedly grew more scientific, he began to dismiss that higher body of knowledge known as theology, divine revelation. Scientists like Galileo became our new high priests and pronounced dogmatic teachings on matters that could neither be observed nor proved, and yet they had to be believed. All the fathers of the church and all our Catholic ancestors believed that the earth was the very center of the universe, that the earth was a special central spot, both spiritually and materially, reflecting the fact that the Son of God and Son of Mary would walk on its surface and that the church would be founded upon this special rock. All of Galileo's so-called proofs, all of them, have been proven wrong by modern science, and yet the geocentric model has been tossed out. That makes God's footstool and Christ's birthplace simply an insignificant speck or grain of material that revolves around a Luciferian sun. The next surrender to scientism came when many Catholics and churchmen began to embrace evolutionism, yet another ideology or religious belief system. Whether in the origin of the universe or in the origin of species, the church was invaded with Big Bang theories and Darwinism. The fathers of the church and our ancestors rejected the ancient pagan notions of a destructive disordered story of creation, and instead accepted, all of them, a fiat creation, where God said, let it be, and all things came forth perfectly formed. And yes, we look at other issues as well. But modern Catholics, by and large, stood idly by as God was turned into a destructive force who brings about creation with explosions and brings about a body for man after eons of death and countless corpses. The God of evolution, small g, the God of evolution brings death and destruction into the world as part of his original plan, whereas the God of the Bible and tradition and true science is the God of life, beauty, artistic perfection, harmony, and order. Every father of the church, without exception, would look upon evolutionism not just as erroneous, but also as blasphemous, as it reflects horribly upon his majesty in heaven. They were a true marine guard, whereas many modern Catholics surrendered and did not respond, allowing a Benghazi-like event within the church. Two more white flags were raised over the embassy of the church, denoting surrender in the area of sacred scripture and ecclesiology, the study of the church. Again, all the great saints, all the doctors, all the popes, all the councils of the church always stated definitively that the original Bible was totally inerrant, totally without any errors. But that complete inerrancy seems to be a problem for modern Catholics who suggest a more narrow or partial inerrancy, applying only to faith and morality, but not to historical statements in science. 
Of course, with God being the primary author of sacred scripture, these modern Catholics, even churchmen, knowingly or unknowingly, attribute error to God himself. Furthermore, our spiritual ancestors held strong to the doctrine that there was one faith and only one church that could bring men to heaven. They believed in the dogma extra ecclesiam nulla salus. Their missionary efforts throughout the world demonstrated this belief, for they sought to bring all men into the ark, into the bark of Peter, the Roman Catholic Church outside which there is no salvation. But now we have many Catholics, including high-ranking prelates, who tell us that the church is supposedly a larger entity than we thought, including many groups within the larger notion of the people of God. The idea of conversion to Catholicism is frowned upon by some. As long as you're a good Baptist, as long as you're a good Buddhist, a good Jew or Muslim, as long as you're a nice person, you'll be fine. We are told that conversion to Catholicism is an outdated ecclesiology, something of the past. Rather, modern Catholics look for an ecumenical convergence or coming together of many groups in some future distant assembly. That's the ideal situation for them. The liturgical surrender was especially painful. All our ancestors worshipped at the traditional Latin Mass. It's Gregorian chant, it's sacral language and proper orientation towards God was brought to many corners of the earth, to barbarians in Europe, to primitive Indians and Africans in their regions, to aboriginal peoples in the Pacific. And yet the liturgy remained essentially the same, presented to the most primitive of people. But when the Western world was supposedly at the highest level of education and learning, in the late 60s and 70s, we were landing people on the moon when literacy rates soared and books and computers were available. The traditional Latin mass became too much for modern man. We couldn't keep up, but we couldn't relate. Modern liturgists told us the ancient mass wasn't entertaining enough. It could no longer be held on to by the people we would have to surrender to a modern culture with a new modern rite that would supposedly be more appealing. Everyday language, the language we used in the streets when we went to the store, would have to be used for a liturgical prayer. Contemporary music that mimicked the music of the world would have to be used. Table altars with the priest acting as a special host. New missiles new rituals, new blessings, everything new, would all prove to be a vital, vital instrument in a new evangelization, which would bring forth a new springtime and a new Pentecost of apostolic fervor. That would be the fruits if it were true. Well, this surrender has proven to be a total failure. As pews become more and more empty, due to the exodus of Catholics from the embassy of the church. Make sure the last one out turns off the lights. Despite all those white flags raised outside our embassies, many quote-unquote conservative Catholics were not that concerned because at least the church held strong on morality, on natural law matters, on pro-life and pro-marriage issues. Being pro-life and in favor of traditional marriage became the only badge of Catholic identity. The only litmus test, it seemed, was holding on to the fifth and sixth commandments. This is how far we have retreated. That's how much Catholics have surrendered. We're pro-life. But in recent months and years, it seems that we are seeing yet a further retreat. Barely a peep was heard from prelates regarding the fate of poor Terry Schiavo. Pro-abortion Catholic politicians go uncorrected 
and they receive Holy Communion regularly and are even rewarded with honorary degrees from Catholic institutions. Direct sterilizations are performed in some Catholic hospitals, while some Catholic hospice groups are accused of euthanizing the terminally ill. We are told not to be overly obsessed with pro-life or pro-marriage issues. The annulment mill continues to turn out their positive decrees. The problem of the contraceptive mentality is rarely touched upon in sermons. Pope Paul VI wrote the encyclical Humanae Vitae in 1968, and the outcry was such that he never wrote another encyclical, though he still had 10 more years in his papal reign. He gave up. Many prelates speak out against sodomitical marriages, that's true, but they seem to be fine with sodomitical unions. And then there is that synod on the family in October of this year at the Vatican, where the topic of the public adulterers being free to receive Holy Communion being openly discussed. Now, are those who say, don't worry, the Holy Ghost is in charge, there will be no surrender here, don't worry about it at all, don't pray, don't worry. How many more white flags do we need to see before we admit that there is a problem? The spirit of the world has seemingly taken over many parts of the embassy of the church. Hostages have been taken and are now captivated by erroneous teaching. This spirit of the world will not stop resisting Christ's kingdom because the devil is all behind it. It is time that we become a church militant once again, that we begin to resist, that we become a loyal guard that protects our king, our kingdom, and all of our religious patrimony without exception. Therefore, pray to the Holy Ghost as Pentecost draws nearer. Continue to pray that Holy Ghost novena, the most important novena in the church. It gives biblical novena. And if you haven't started praying it, pick it up and pray it. Ask the Holy Ghost that he might renew and restore the membership of the church, that we may once again be true ambassadors of Christ and his kingdom, the Catholic Church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.